us today, Gabe Farber, who is a second generation Holocaust survivor, meaning his parents were Holocaust survivors, and of course, Joe Diamond. Joe appeared with me at Buffalo State College, where I teach, uh, in a program for young people who have no, uh, no systematic historical connection to the Holocaust, and many of them have uh, had not much exposure to the, uh, to the history of it at all. And yet they were able to relate to him, understand what it meant to be a young man, barely, barely out of childhood, uh, in Czechoslovakia, caught up in this monstrous business. Nobody believed it when it happened. It's, uh, even today, it's, it's difficult to believe, and there are a number of people who find it impossible to believe it. Uh, people, uh, people of various degrees of good faith or not so much good faith who question the Holocaust altogether. It has been, uh, it has been a subject of debate, amazingly enough. Justice Jackson thought he finished the whole business. He thought that this would be an exposure. So did Eisenhower, by the way. Thought this would be an exposure once and for all time. Eisenhower's words to that effect are carved in stone in Washington, D.C. in the United States National Memorial Holocaust uh, Museum in D.C. And uh, Eisenhower himself said that he wanted a monument to establish that this thing really happened because if he hadn't seen it with his own eyes, people wouldn't believe it. Well, we have come a long way since then. We now look back and we say that there are holocausts going on right now, not just the one that Sandra Day O'Connor referred to, it's still going on. And as for anti-Semitism in particular, we had thought we had seen the last of it. Well, it, we haven't. And there is all the more reason in this generation, new generation of racial hate, there is all the more reason for us to listen very carefully to what people like Joe Diamond have to say. Without further comment, Joe. It's a great honor for us to be invited to the historical city of Jamestown and to the Jackson Center. Can anybody hear me? As the world looked on, Germany tried to erase our people from the corners of the earth. My family, myself, we lived in a small town in Czechoslovakia. It's now the Czech Republic. As a matter of fact, it's called the Carpathian region. It's the hillbilly part of Czechoslovakia. We lived in a small town, population about 700. We had people with different religion, Roman Catholic, Greek Catholic, Protestant, Jewish, and people got along harmoniously. There were rumors going on that we may have another war. Nobody got excited because they have wars in Europe every two weeks. A guy by the name of Hitler was constantly on the radio. He wasn't talking, he was yelling. Some people listened to him. And some people got indoctrinated, believe it or not. Anyhow, you couldn't help it. The, world, the war began and the German army moved into our village. Those soldiers looked real elite. They had all the latest equipment. As a matter of fact, they were on their way to Russia. They used our village as a route. But the minute they stepped in our town, discrimination and racism was legal. If you were Jewish or Jewish ethnicity, you were forced to wear a yellow star. I was proud to wear it from the ages of three. Since we're all Caucasians, they want to know who you are so you can be humiliated, maybe beaten up. Police just turn their cheek. The next laws were silly stuff. We couldn't walk on a sidewalk. It was a luxury to walk on a sidewalk. And every time a German officer, you, you meet a German officer, you have to bow to him and greet him. They must be gods. So all these little things were happening. We heard stories, people are getting killed in Poland and Denmark, but you know, you don't really take it seriously until things happen. I'm going to skip now about three years. It was already 1944. It looks like Germany has had it. The same troops, they look like Roman heroes, just talked to you a minute ago. They came back from Russia. 
They froze to death. They came back by horse and buggy. Their cities are being bombed. So we were all hoping they got enough problems, maybe they'll forget about us. You know, they're losing the war, they're losing their homes, Germany's finished. But guess what? Hey, they didn't forget about us, about the Jewish people. It was more important for them to kill us than to win the war. This sounds insane. So March the 22nd, 1944, there was an article in the paper, a notice in the paper. All Jews, uh, Jewish ethnicity, will have to be packed within 24 hours and they'll be taken away because they're a security risk. And they can only take with them what they can carry, approximately 35 pounds. It was a real shock. We lived there for generations. My great-grandparents, you know, we had farms and we owned this grocery store, all of a sudden you're going to leave this and who knows what's going to happen to you. But then you look at the German soldier, he's just like you and me, he looks civil, normal human being, the way they talk. So we were hoping, you know, this war is going to be end and we're going to come home and everything is going to be okay. But that's not the case. Next morning we were all ready for him. We were packed. I was about 15 years old, my mom was 39, my brother was seven years old. Two stormtroopers came right into our kitchen with fixed bayonets, like we're major criminals. They told us, folks, you're prisoners now, and you're going to be taken to a local school for processing before you're taken away. Meanwhile, he says, we're going to assemble you on Main Street. It's about two and a half miles to the school. So you got to carry your luggage, and you got your star, your yellow star and uh, just wait your turn so we can all walk as a group because there's next door neighbors and all the way down the line. People next door were brought out. So we assembled approximately 600 people on Main Street walking towards the school. Silly looking luggage and the star. They had soldiers guarding us in the front, on the flanks, on the rear, like we were major criminals. No wonder they didn't win the war. They spent all their time here policing. As we were walking, some of our neighbors were watching us. They didn't look upset. They acted like it's the 4th of July. One guy even said, he yelled out, I'll never forget. Hey, leave me your winter coat. <laughs> I guess we're going to be all done. I thought if I ever survive, I'll probably want to talk to this man or who knows what else. It's just the little things you remember. Anyway, we finally got to the, the school. They checked us all out, checked our luggage out, all these protocols, and we were on the way now to another city. They took people from all these small areas. This brick factory, there was all kind of space. There were no sanitary facilities. They told us that we're only going to be here three weeks because wherever our final destination is, it's very busy. So here we were. Sleeping out two days ago, you had a normal home, you had a heating system here, you're outside, it's wet. Uh, you're nothing. <laughs> you're, nobody speaks for you, nobody represents you. But the three weeks passed and we, they were ready to take us. They notified, uh, notified us on the PA system, the trucks are here to take us to the railroad station. So trucks came down here, about 40 of them, they looked like they look kind of crude. They look like coal trucks or lumber trucks. No human being can get on them. But they expected senior citizens, little children, to get on these trucks. I'll never forget this little lady was struggling to get on the truck, and some of the soldiers were just watching it. They thought it was fun. Some of the children were crying. They lost their parents in the confusion. There was nothing unusual for one of the stormtroopers to pick up a baby and throw them in the truck. I mean, you're just saying to yourself, well, didn't these people have their own kids, you know? But these are some of the introductions that we were gonna go through. Anyway, we finally got on the trucks. It was about an open truck, it was about two and a half hour ride, and we came to the railroad stations. The railroad stations are called Bahnhof in German. A lot of activity, there's a war going on, trains are going back and forth, and we also noticed a lot of boxcars lined up, about 40 of them. Cattle cars, crude-looking opening for, uh, for air. 
So everybody thought they must be shipping cattle to the Russian front or whatever. But it didn't take long to find out that's going to be our transportation. If you had to put in people standing in that cattle train, it could probably hold about 40 people standing. They squeezed 110 of us in there, like sardines. They gave us a bucket of water, which I never saw, and they told us, good luck, the train started moving. There was about 40 of them, these boxcars. They were going very slow because of the weight. They were going 28 miles per hour, and that was bad for us because we had a major crisis inside. People were fainting couple of dead children after a couple of days. After traveling for two days and a night, the train arrived in Krakow, Poland. They told us we we're going to Germany. Here we were in Poland. I'll never forget where people were yelling for water. Some little lady, must have been a Polish citizen, approached the train with two buckets of water. Two buckets of water wouldn't do much, but here was a human being. As she got to the train, the German soldier kicked her out right of her hands. She said, I'm sorry, those people had enough water. Something you always remember about human beings. Anyway, the train continued its journey. It was in two and a half hours we arrived at our destination. We had no idea where we were. Finally, the doors were open. We see a complete confusion. A sign in front of us says, in German, Arbeit macht frei, that means work will make you free and welcome to Auschwitz. It said Auschwitz too. We had no idea what that meant. We found out there's Auschwitz I, which is a normal prisoner of war camp. Auschwitz II is an extermination camp. It's also called Birkenau. It's in the birch woods. They told us we'll have to move real fast and get out of the train because we're going to be interviewed. It took a little longer for our cattle train to get out. So one of the stormtroopers came in with his gun and he says to one of the service prisoners, what's taking so long to get these idiots out? He says, sir, some lady just gave birth. We're trying to protect the child. This soldier <coughs> picks up this little baby and kicked it out in the field like a football. Okay? This, uh, it, I, this I never forget, it's always on my mind. Anyway, so we finally, they told us we're, we're being interviewed because there are three German officers about 500 yards north of us. They're going to find out what each person can qualify work to do because we have children, old men, religious people. Also, they're going to decide who's going to live and who's going to die. They didn't tell us that, but, you know, they must be some gods. So here we are standing in line. My little brother, confused looking, sad, crying. My mom, confused. We were inching our way for about four and a half hours until finally we came in front of the interviewer. One of them spoke directly to my mom. I didn't know who it was, but I found out it was Dr. Mangala. Anybody heard of that name? Angel of Death. He also enjoyed doing this. He asked her, how old is your son, the younger one? She said, he's seven years old. He says, okay, now you and the boy were going to ship into a residential camp, and me and my dad are going to go to a labor camp, and we can visit on weekends. <laughs> we hardly had a chance to look at him again. They just threw him in trucks, and believe me, this is the last time I saw him. Never saw him again. They didn't go to no residential camp. That was all a made-up story. They went directly to the killing field. They went directly to the chamber. And so did about 70 people from our train. Religious people, senior citizens, handicaps. They went directly to the crematorium. Four chambers were working full blast. In 1944, it was like, it was the year of the hurrah. That's when most people were killed. You could kill 1,600 people a day in the gas chamber. Germany was proud of that. They didn't care about winning war. They could kill 1,600. Eichmann, Himmler, they kept reporting to Hitler what they're accomplishing here. 
Meanwhile, trails are rolling in. As they approach the, the, as they approach the gas chamber, they were waiting in the woods because they're, they're loaded, they're filled up, they had to wait for their turn. They kept yet lying to the people, telling them soon they'll have water, they'll have showers. Finally, they did come in, and instead of water coming down, zy zyclone be used, go right on top of them. They needed oxygen. Within 20 minutes, they were fainting and dropping dead. I can just see my mom. They didn't fall on the floor. They fell on top of each other. Then the furnaces took over. You could pile six, seven people on stretchers and took them to the furnace. And this was all done by prisoners, too. These guys were Jewish, too. They were trained to kill their own brothers. I'm going to get away from the gas chamber for a minute. My dad and me were put uh, to a disinfected air, got our clothes off. Now everybody got prison clothes. Everybody got a number. Some of us got some of us got tattooed later. From here on, you have a number. You don't call your your friend or your buddy. You call him by a number. You're just a number. The silly looking clothes. Striped clothes was real thin, it didn't fit anybody. We took showers and they assigned us to barracks. My dad and me were separated. They sent them to a camp called Buchenwald. And they put me together between 3,500 guys between the ages of 14 and 17. They told us we, there's scarlet fever going on and we can't get out of our barracks. Nobody was sick, they just didn't know what to do with us. Just to give you a little geography of the area, next to our barracks was a woman's camp. It was called C Camp. It was sad to see these ladies with their hair shorn off, sad looking faces. They looked new, they looked fairly new. They got, we were separated from them by barbed wire. If you touched it, you got electrocuted. Every now and then, if you had an extra piece of bread, and we threw it to them and they got close to it, they got electrocuted. Every morning you could see <coughs> When you got up, you could see 20, 30 women hanging from the barbed wire, committing suicide. All they were yelling over is to see, have I seen their sons? Have we seen their husbands? This has been going on every day. As far as our group goes, after the quarantine was over, they assigned us to do work. Our job was to carry brick and masonry materials from a masonry area to the gas chamber area. You carried blocks on your back, with a bag, carried bricks in your arm, and you went for two and a half miles because they were already building another gas chamber. The footings were in. So our job, so we actually helped build another gas chamber because they couldn't take care of the people that are coming in every day. After doing this kind of work and witnessing these conditions, some of us began to look real bad. We looked like skeletons, dragging your feet, your face, your eyes are getting bigger, including myself. You see a German soldier on guard duty and you're going to yell, Sir, can you spare a piece of bread? <laughs> Not too long ago we went to school, we had a normal life here, we're asking for a piece of bread. I'll never forget when the guy threw a sandwich, 20 of us were diving for it. You forget about your family. You forget about everything. You only think of yourself. It's survival of the fittest. At night, you'll steal from your best friend a piece of bread to survive. This is what's been going on from 3,500 of us, 320 survived. The rest of them were taken through selections to the gas chamber every few weeks. Dr. Mangala came and picked the weakest among us, because they're not going to support people that are useless. They want strong people, and they're the ones that made them weak. So one day they, they come and they tell us they're going to send us to bricklaying school. Instead of the bricklaying school, they send the, send the guys to the gas chamber. Two weeks later, 1,400 of us are gone. From 3,500, 320 of us survived, and I'm one of them. I feel guilty standing here and talking about it, so maybe 
I'm the messenger. The Russian army was getting close to Auschwitz. Germany didn't want to be liberated by the Russians. The Russians were angry. They wanted to get even. So they tried to go to areas where the Allies are liberating. So we, we, they took us by train going towards Berlin. There was a bombing that took place, so we had to get off the train and we started walking. Walking turned into a death march. We came to a place called Sachsenhausen. They wouldn't let us in because it's filled, so we had to stand at attention for eight hours until everybody was just, some of us were dropping to de dead and as they were standing. Continuing moving us to different camps, after many brushes of death, we wound up in Austria, a place called place called Oranienburg, uh, Sachsenhausen, getting mixed up with the words. In that camp, there was no, no room to stand. They didn't know what they're going to do with us. They said they're going to torch the place before we get liberated. Some of the soldiers were bored. They started target practicing. One guy was tied up to a rafter with a blanket. He takes his gun and shoots him down. Soldiers mingle with the prisoners and just start shooting. Believe me, these guys looked normal, intelligent, but a killer inside. The most civilized people in the world, people that gave us science, art, they were the killers. How can you forgive? We don't hate all German people, but there's no closure for the ones that followed Hitler's footsteps. There was no reason for that. I lost 39 people in my family, little babies, cousins, all gone. Looks like the war is over. We started walking out of the camp. After walking for two and a half miles, we see trucks, jeeps, and an infantry unit coming towards us. And the closer they got, the better they looked. So we were liberated by Patton's division, they called it the American Third Army. Those guys, to me, were the Messiah. They couldn't believe what we looked like. They picked us up, and some of us died in their arms. Took me to a hospital, to Linz. By the way, the town was Gunskirchen. I forgot the name of it, which is OK. I was in the hospital for three weeks. I ran away from the hospital because all the doctors were German, and I, in my mind, I thought I was back in the concentration camp. I walked the streets of Linz like a bum. I met some Russian soldiers, and they said they're, they're going by truck towards my area. So I hitchhiked my way home. I had no money. I depended on just getting from somebody else. After three weeks, I arrived in my hometown. The minute I got off the truck, the same, the same roads that were paved roads were dirt roads. It looks like the town is going backwards. All the stores that the Jews owned are still closed. And the first thing that people asked me, hey, how come you're alive? I thought they killed you all. Well, sorry, disappoint you. Some, a lot of them are afraid they have to give us back their property they took away from us. I went to my house. There's still German family living there. I went to the Russian authority and asked them, I'd like my house back so we can get these people out in 15 minutes. I says, no, give them 24 hours. I don't want to do what they did. So I got back to our house. It was very sad memories. Nobody's home. <laughs> Everybody's gone. But something good happened. My dad did survive, but he didn't know who I was. He was really in bad shape. It took him a long time to get back to normal. It looks like there was no future to stay here. Communism was going to take over. 
all your property is gone, so you've got to start from the beginning. My father decided to stay. He says he's too old. He was only 60 years old. But in those days, 60 was like 80 now. So I walked the streets of Prague, Czechoslovakia. I had no money in my pocket. I had no food. I didn't know what I was doing. I finally got in contact with some organization that helped us, and they brought me to England. The British government helped us out as the beginning of the war. While I was in England, I found out I had relatives in Buffalo, but I didn't know their address, so we wrote a letter to the mayor of Buffalo, and they found my uncles. And in those days, you couldn't come under a refugee status. You had to have an affidavit from somebody, a guarantor. So uh, 1948, I arrived, arrived here in Buffalo and New York City. I had five dollars in my pocket and a will to live. I tried to get a job. I had no experience. The only experience I had is concentration camp and I was 16 years old now. I hitchhiked my way back to New York. I worked in a lady's factory, I, on a production line, I didn't last long there either. So here we are, not only did we lose everything, but where are we going from here? The Korean War started, it's 1950, and guess what, I was drafted into the Army. That was a draft age. I was all excited, I was proud to be serving. I took my basic training in Fort Dix, New Jersey, and we were definitely going to go to North to Korea. In the last minute, they changed their minds. The orders were going, to, were going to Germany as occupation troops. Well, I, I became alive. I couldn't wait. I want to go back. I want to see the killers. I want to see their faces. But you know, once I got to Stuttgart, a little town called Ludwigsburg, Germany, you see the population, things are getting normal. People are walking the streets. Kids are playing outside. How am I going to get you? Am I going to start machine gunning people? I'm not a killer. They were the killers. The only way I can get even, tell my history to folks like yourself and talk to children in the schools. And we want to make sure that something like this doesn't happen again. The key is that we don't want to be bystanders. That's what happened in my town. When they took us away, the peop I call those people bystanders. Nobody demonstrated, they just let everybody go. Things are happening here again. We got problems in Darfur, who knows? You know, that word never again is not really coming through. But we'll have to keep on fighting and make sure that something like this doesn't happen. I'd like to thank everybody for their patience and I'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much.